Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. It's an honor to be here. I'm going to speak to you about sleep. And since you're all biohackers, I suspect that you know the basics of good sleep hygiene. So I'm going to speak about more cutting edge ways to improve sleep. And I'll also speculate about some novel ways to improve sleep, which haven't yet been tested, but make sense based on the mechanisms. And there's a great chapter on sleep in the biohackers handbook. So I suggest that you will go and check that out. Sleep is weird. While we sleep, we can't eat, we can't drink, we can't have sex, and we're at our most vulnerable. So there should have been strong evolutionary pressure against the development of sleeping. But all species studied have sleep-like behavior, and we spend a third of our lives sleeping. So if sleep doesn't serve absolutely vital functions, then it's surely the greatest mistake that evolution ever made. But we don't value sleep. On average, during work days, sleep durations decreased by about 37 minutes over the last decade. And we're the only species that artificially restricts its sleep. About 7% of Europeans now suffer from insomnia, making it the second most prevalent mood disorder. And to really hit home how detrimental this is, each one hour decrease in sleep duration that people get below seven hours a night is associated with a 6% increase of death from any cause. But to actually show that sleep loss causes dysfunction, we need experiments in which people come into the lab and their sleep is restricted. We've known for about 20 years or so that as little as five nights of sleep restriction to four hours per night is enough to make previously healthy people temporarily pre-diabetic. But if we take the opposite situation where you have people who regularly restrict their sleep and then have them come into the lab and extend their sleep, what happens? In one experiment, they compared what happens when people get 10 hours of time in bed to six hours of time in bed in young men. They came to the lab over the course of three days on two consecutive Fridays. And as we see here, in the 10-hour condition, they got about three hours more sleep. Let's now look at insulin sensitivity, as shown here by the light blue bars. After 10 hours, insulin sensitivity was 45% higher. Now, if sleep loss also affected people's food intake, then these metabolic consequences could be compounded. And this is exactly what happens. So if you look at all the evidence that's been published to date, on average, sleep restriction increases energy intake by about the same amount as the number of calories in four apples. That might not sound like much, but if you tally that over the course of 365 days in the year, then that's over 130,000 extra calories. And that's how, much that's how much energy is in about 17 kilograms of fat tissue. If you take people who regularly shorten their sleep and then ask them to extend their sleep for four weeks, then on average, they consume about 10 grams less added sugar. And those who accurately report their diets also consume less carbohydrate and less fat. And this suggests that sleep extension can influence aspects of decision-making. In a famous study, they looked at what happens when people were only allowed four hours or six hours of time in bed for two weeks and sleep loss resulted in cumulative, dose-dependent deficits in all measures of cognitive function. But in another study, they looked at what happens when obese, short-sleeping adults were asked to extend their sleep for 15 months. And in this circumstance, on average, cognitive function improved by about 7% and attention by 10%. They also tend to experience better memory. So the point that I'm trying to drill home is that it seems that no aspect of human biology evades the negative consequences of poor sleep. But fortunately, improving sleep in people with poor sleep seems to quickly reverse some of these effects. So what can you do to get better sleep? Don't have kids. Seriously, 
to answer this question, it's useful to understand how sleep is regulated. And the most widely accepted model of sleep regulation is this two-process model. So in this model, the black sine wave depicts wakefulness, and it's driven by the circadian system. This is the circadian process. It increases over the course of the day, and then it wanes at night. And this process repeats of its own accord day after day. And you know the post-lunch slump that you so often experience? That's related to a temporary decrease in wakefulness drive at this time of day. So if any of you guys feel compelled to have a quick nap now, don't worry, I won't be offended. The other process is shown in blue, and this is the sleep process. This accumulates with prolonged wakefulness, and it's then paid off when we sleep. On average, adults need about eight hours of time in bed each night to fully pay off this process. And when that happens, these two lines meet. The person awakes the next day feeling reinvigorated. But if they don't get enough sleep, they wake to an alarm, for example, then they have residual sleep pressure from the previous day, and they find themselves reaching for coffee. Now, this circadian process is primarily orchestrated by a master clock in the brain which is responsive to light exposure. Light exposure suppresses melatonin synthesis by the pineal gland, and then melatonin relays this darkness signal throughout the body. If you have to wake at a certain time for work, for instance, and you want to get more sleep, then one way of doing so is by shifting this system earlier. And another way that you can accomplish this is by wearable light therapy glasses, like those made by AO. So you can increase your exposure to bright blue lights early in the day. The main correlate of the sleep process is what are called somnogens, which are just sleep-promoting chemicals in the brain. You can think of these like chemical barometers of how long you've been awake. And the main one of these is adenosine. So these are accumulating in your brain as you sit here right now. It kind of makes sense because Adenosine is a breakdown product of ATP. So things that you do during the day that require you to burn energy increase levels of adenosine in the extracellular fluid in your brain. This promotes sleep, which is a quiescent state in which these levels can then be paid off. You wake up the next day feeling good. I'm just going to speak briefly about the different stages of sleep that we cycle through each evening. So, while we're awake, we have these high-frequency, asynchronous patterns of activity in the brain, much like people chatting in a crowd at a football match. Then, as we enter sleep, it becomes progressively deeper over the course of the night. And by deeper, I just mean that it's harder to arouse someone from that state. Then, at the end of each cycle, we enter rapid eye movement sleep. It's called that just because of the ways that the eyes dart back and forth during the stage. It's a strange stage because our muscles are paralyzed at this time so that we don't act out our dreams. But parts of the brain are as much as 30% more active than they are during the daytime. And humans spend more time in rapid eye movement sleep than any other primates. What's interesting is that this stage is very important to creativity and emotion regulation. So based on this, some people speculate that the amount of REM sleep that we have has been pivotal in the evolution of our intelligence and complex social structures. The cycles repeat every 90 minutes or so, and as they repeat, we spend a higher proportion of our time in REM sleep, which therefore serves as a kind of gateway to awakening each day. But I'm going to focus in particular on N3 sleep, which is the deepest stage of sleep. So like people now chanting and then falling silent in unison, N3 sleep is characterized by these high amplitude, slow waves, which are synchronized. And the waves just comprise periods of neuronal excitation and silence too. One thing that's important about this stage is that it leads to durable changes in the strength of signaling between neurons. Now, as we learn things during the day, these memories are encoded. And then these patterns are then replayed in a seahorse-shaped structure named the hippocampus in the brain, 
And these brain waves are called sharp wave ripples. They're replayed at very high speed. During deep sleep, another type of brain wave called sleep spindles then helps transfer these memories from this short term storage depot in the hippocampus to a longer term memory vault in the neocortex. And the important thing to understand is that slow waves and deep sleep coordinate this transfer by synchronizing the waves. Not only that, deep sleep is important to our ability to plan, initiate, and monitor behaviors. It's crucial to blood sugar regulation and therefore diabetes risk. And these effects are mediated by slow waves. By slow waves, by slow waves I just mean brain waves that occur one to four times each second. Importantly, the main thing that drives these slow waves is the amount of adenosine in the brain. So the more energy that your brain burns during the day, the greater the slow wave activity and the more likely you are to, ex benefits the, to experience these benefits of deep sleep. But adenosine isn't the only somnogen and others include inflammatory cytokines and prostaglandin D2. Arachidonic acid is a conditionally essential fatty acid found in abundance in beef and chicken, and it's precursed to all three of these. So I wonder if there are circumstances in which consuming arachidonic acid may benefit sleep. During sleep loss, nitric oxide accumulates in the basal forebrain, and this promotes sleep in part by raising brain adenosine levels. So perhaps consuming nitrate-rich foods like spinach or beetroot may boost brain nitric oxide and thereby encourage deep sleep. We can also target sleep by either reducing the synthesis or accelerating the breakdown of wake-promoting neuromodulators in the brain, or we can target their receptors. So diphenhydramine, for example, is an inverse agonist that histamine H1 receptors in the brain, and through this action, it tends to reduce the amount of time that it takes people to fall asleep, but also prolong sleep duration. The problem with these drugs is that they tend to lead to tolerance over time and can induce withdrawal effects too. And then we could also increase the synthesis or reduce the breakdown of sleep-promoting neuromodulators. And many plant sleep remedies act through these, through these pathways. So, Valerian and lemon balm, for instance, tend to increase GABA signaling in the brain. I suspect that many of these may also lead to tolerance over time, though, much like the drugs do. Some hormones are also important to slow wave activity, and foremost among these are growth hormone and prolactin. So activities like exercise and sex that boost these hormones may also help you deepen your sleep. Gut microbiota are, of course, really important to stress responses and inflammation. So there are probably circumstances in which it makes sense to supplement with prebiotics and certain strains of probiotics in order to improve our responses to stress. There's been some work recently showing that if you deprive an animal of sleep, then brown fat thermogenesis is increased the subsequent day. And this effect seems to be mediated by an increase in uncoupling protein one expression. Because if you knock out this protein, then this rebound increase in sleep duration the next day is abolished. So what I wonder is that perhaps consuming things that boost brown fat thermogenesis like chili peppers, capsinoids, capsaicinoids, could increase brown fat thermogenesis and thereby increase the pressure to sleep. Cold exposure will also increase brown fat thermogenesis. But the problem with this is that extremes of temperature in general will have an alerting effect on people. So if you're going to use this, then I would only recommend doing so early in the day. Temperature in general is important to sleep because heating the body activates these warm, sensitive neurons in the hypothalamus. And by doing so, you increase low wave activity. So what you actually want to do is raise your skin temperature by a couple of degrees shortly before sleep. The reason is that you'll create this temperature gradient between your core and your skin, which will help you radiate heat out from your core. That's key because around the time that you fall asleep, the temperature of your, drain, your brain drops by a couple of degrees, and that facilitates sleep onset. 
one way of accomplishing this is just through a warm shower. So 10 minute shower of about 40 degrees Celsius within an hour of sleep should help. And interestingly, supplementing with three grams of L-glycine has been shown to improve sleep. And it's probably partly related to this mechanism. The reason is that glycine binds to NMDA receptors, which is a subtype of glutamate receptor in the master clock in the circadian system. And by doing so, it facilitates peripheral vasodilation. And that just helps people lose heat and thereby benefits their sleep. When we fall asleep, a part deep within the brain called the thalamus blocks incoming sensory stimuli from disrupting sleep. And this is the reason that we don't really hear things or see things or feel things while we sleep. But that doesn't mean that sensory stimuli can't affect sleep. Aromatherapy is one example of this. And diffusing jasmine oil by the bedside tends to reduce how much time people spend awake when they're trying to sleep. Cedar extract helps people fall asleep faster. And the most studied aromatherapy is lavender oil by the bedside. Lavender oil tends to increase slow wave activity and also sleep spindles. And by doing so, it's been shown to improve sleep quality, prolong sleep duration, but also enhance people's memories. And those effects are probably just mediated by the olfactory system. Another thing that we can do is use non-invasive methods of stimulating the brain because doing so will excite the underlying neurons, increase their energy expenditure, and then increase slow wave activity in those neurons in a region-specific manner. And this type of stimulation has consistently been shown to enhance people's memories too. And it's normally placed over the frontal lobes of the brain, which is just an area about two inches above the bridge of the nose. The type of brain wave that I haven't mentioned is a K-complex. And what these are, are a kind of sleep protecting mechanism. So if you nudge someone while they sleep, you reliably induce a K-complex. And associated with that comes increased low wave activity and sleep spindle activity too. And one way of increasing K-complexes or inducing them is through timely delivery of pink noise stimuli. And these types of stimuli have consistently been shown to enhance people's memory formation during sleep. There's a two consumer device now called Dream, which uses pink noise stimulation too. But the problem is that whereas in the research, the pink noise was delivered in synchrony with a specific part of each slow wave, the Dream device doesn't necessarily do that. Finally, you know the way that you intuitively rock babies from side to side to help them fall asleep? Well, rocking adults from side to side at a rate of about once every four seconds actually reliably helps people fall asleep faster. It also increases sleep spindles and slow wave, slow wave activity. And it seems to do this by stimulating the vestibular system such that these brain waves are better synchronized with each other. So there's probably something to having a nap in a hammock. I'm currently compiling a resource for human OS on all the best methods to enhance sleep. So it'd be great if some of you guys came to check it out. And I hope that you've enjoyed this talk and sleep well tonight. Thank you very much.